Uh, the two core components of my work are the idea that we can't change the past, but we can always change our relationship to it, and the idea that we have the power to rewrite the ending to stories of historical injustice. And so I appreciated having the, the musical narrative and then my own narrative um, that I hope really sunk in as this idea that it was a continuous story. Um, I, you know, Alonzo Tucker's life didn't end in 1902, but his story continues on. Uh, and so I hope that this can be a starting place for how we think about stories of historical injustice, that we can actually do things contemporarily to add new chapters to their history. Um, and so I hope that inspires you to try and add more chapters to these stories that are in our history. So hopefully we can have this righting our wrongs moment uh, as a country. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd also love to talk to both Daryl and Mimi. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about um, Daryl and about how you two came to work together and your your process. Because I love the coming up with the twelve words and maybe you just tell these friends about about that relationship. Well, so some of that is written in the program notes um, about Mimi's and my collaboration. But I was particularly um, interested in writing with her when I came up with this idea of, of Sankofa as a theme and recognizing that somebody, um, thinking that someone of African heritage um, where this sort of, this, this concept originated would be really um, a useful sort of energizing force for me. And plus, she, she's an amazing writer. Um, and I guess, you know, um, you know, true, uh, what do, they, what do they say when they say, uh, I can't remember the, the term, but um, our, our kids went to the same school. <laughs> and uh, her kids are these amazing, like, sort of leaders, and they were such an inspiration. Um, and one in particular was a real inspiration to my son. So, And I also got to witness Mimi's incredible leadership in that framework. And so I knew she was a, a really powerful person and a powerful writer, and I just thought I wanted to be able to collaborate with her on this project. Mimi, what was it like to hear the musical setting of your words and, and what did that mean to you? So, thank you. So I, you know, I'm a long form writer to begin with, right? And so when I started to write poetry freelance and my friends would say, this is great. This I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. It's not my genre, but it's okay. So when Daryl asked and said, write text, write text for me for this work. I was like, oh my God, he's going to trust me with his music, because that's how I see it. The gift to me is the music, right? So when I listen to um, the composer tell me what the context is of what they want to write or the theme, it's a gift because it starts up the process for me. So when we met and he said, I want to write about this, but what was particularly exciting for me is that he didn't want to write about our trauma, even though he wanted it represented. He wanted to write about triumph, and I understand the value in, in the history. I get it. I understand the work that you're doing, um, but I like the celebration of the triumph. I like the going back, moving forward, with presence of mind, knowing that there is some place from where we come and there's history there, but moving forward and presenting our best selves to the world. So that's, that was exciting for me. That was exciting for me. Shohei, I want to shout you out in particular because you first learned about Taylor's work and um, started to connect all of these dots. And I wonder if you can talk about that and, and again, what it feels like to now have the, the dots be here uh, in, in this space to, together today. Yeah, I mean, Taylor and I met uh, in this like online, like through mutual friends, like online Zoom uh, mutual aid group and like political education group basically we eventually called it like seeds of collectivity and uh, uh, it lived especially like through 2020 2021 and we were just talking about it earlier and Taylor was like you know that um, that really like just logging on and like seeing everybody really got me through like that pretty hard time and um, 
and it was through that that I learned about Taylor and I learned about his work with Organ Remembrance Project, sort of single-handedly um, doing this amazing work, um, driving all the way down, all the way around Oregon, uh, Coos Bay and Oregon City, all this stuff. Um, and so when we were brainstorming last year um, with Damien and Kathy, this sort of uh, artistic advising sort of group, um, all I knew was like, it'd be great to have Taylor involved. Um, we were coming off the heels of last year's March concert. Um, at, at, like during that Q&A, I brought up Taylor's work um, and this vision of, of abolishing the death penalty. And, um, and so I thought, okay, Taylor should be involved in some way. Um, there's this amendment piece, maybe we can have that involved. And then, okay, this commission. And so when serendipitously, Daryl and Mimi are thinking of this Sankofa idea of this bird looking backward and getting this, this pearl, this treasure, and moving forward, um, it was like somehow this magical synergy happened and, it, and then today happens. So it feels like I, I just... Trusting, it definitely taught me a lot about like trusting in process, trusting in if you are committed to including some part in the larger mosaic that the image will form. You know, the image will just come together and you can kind of place the little tiles and eventually this thing will become clear. So yeah, it was really sweet. So uh, do any of you all have some questions? And I wonder, Graham, are you back there? Could we get house lights up? Thank you. Yes, I see a hand right there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious why um, Daryl Mamie's piece was placed where it was, mm. being a world premiere and um, being so much more than The, the question was, why did we choose to place Daryl and Mimi's premiere where it went in the program or when it went in the program? Do you want to address that? Sure. Uh, well, two things. One, because uh, uh, I think w one way that like the kind of two threads of like the music and Taylor's narrative um, uh, uh, magically coincided is the way that Taylor's uh, story turns um, towards uh, the work that we're doing today in that second chunk. Um, so there's a little bit of that and, uh, and this looking back, go, go look, seek, take, return um, directive of Mimi's text. There's also, uh, just by chance, I, don't, I just realized this now, but this caged bird uh, text and then the Sankofa bird image are sort of aligned in a way too. Um, and so, uh, I think also just uh, program-wise or in a composition, uh, people like to do a sort of like golden mean magic moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so like at a sort of like roughly two thirds point, if something really special happens there, um, then, and there's like a denouement after or whatever, um, that uh, this is a good place for something special to happen. So I think those, I would say those two things. I actually didn't even get that until today's performance where um, the, the synchronicity of the two bird metaphors, um, the caged bird, and in that piece, the clarinet is playing the role of the bird. And in my piece, the cello is playing the role of the Sankofa bird. And so I just thought having those back to back was really synchronistic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, fabulous. Thank you. It adds to the sunshine of today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Karen Wells. Uh, you've not met me, but that's okay. Uh, three things. Um, for Mr. Grant and Ms. Say, is that how we do that? The creative process from start to finish took how long? <laughs> Well, you'll have to ask Mimi about her creative process. When, um, what is this, March? Um, I'm going to say, so we worked, we talked about this last summer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like the summer when we, when we first talked about it. And so I believe that I asked Mimi to have me final text by November. I think that was my goal. Um, and for me, 
um, being a first time choral composer and also being really, really neurotic about not being late with my <laughs> deliverables. Um, I was, and as I do with my students, I was like, okay, how, mu how much time do you think this will take you? I had written a 75 minute opera um, and that took me a couple years. <laughs> so I figured, okay, well, if I just generally allot 100 hours of my time, um, you know, in and around my job, 100 hours, 100 hours seemed good. It took a bit more because it's never realistic to tell a composer, like, the last little bit could take another 100 hours. <laughs> and what I'm going to do immediately after this recording to revise it will be another. <laughs> but anyway, so that was sort of the, the process for me, the timeline. It's like from November until January when I had to deliver the piece was when I had to write it. Mm -hmm. what about you? That's the music. And um, for me, the writing itself, we met, I think, for the first time in October. Like, we talked in the summer, but actually met in your office in October. And I said, um, okay, November. That's, that, that so looks great. Like but we had the words by then. We'd picked the 12. So what we did is initially we asked just both of us to come up with 12 words. So he came up with 12. I came up with 12. And that was the initial. That was just the beginning. And so those were percolating for a while. And then when we met the second time in October, um, he, we, we decided to work from the words moving forward. And that took, I would say, a month because it was to be delivered in November. And I wasn't late. So. It was late. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't late at all. <laughs> Karen, you had more. Yeah, I do. Um, and so for that part, thank you so much for focusing on triumph. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, focus on that, yes, there's misery, yes, there's tragedy, yes, there's trauma. Yet to focus on triumph means that they don't. Mm -hmm. We, and we are still here. Mm -hmm. So that's good. And then for Mr. Stewart, mm -hmm. um, do you, I imagine, given what you shared with us, you do uh, presentations, like educationals, in the Portland metro area? And how do I find you? And before I say that, it's because um, I'm with the North Northeast chapter of AARP. We are the largest chapter and Oregon, and we are predominantly African American. Mm -hmm. And I think you want to book in case that's top to us. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I do a variety of presentations across the Portland area. Um, I've got my usual talk, which is more about the contents of the work. Um, but in May, uh, May 4th, um, I am doing a training with Oregon Humanities. Um, that will be at the historic Alberta House, so not far from here. Um, and so that will be, that is, um, so depending on what you're interested in, that will be strategies for racial justice organizing. So beyond the like story and the content, how do you actually go about, hi, I'm this kid from Portland, and I'd like to put up a historical marker, but one of the worst things that ever happened here. Um, and people don't generally say, oh man, I'm so glad you're here. Um, how do you get from a place? <laughs> oh, we, we wish. Um, so how do you get from that place of like, all right, here's an idea to how do you create a project where the actual strategy is involved? Um, so that's May 4th. Uh, you can sign up via the Oregon Humanities. Um, that little workshop title is called So Much Together. Um, but in terms of other presentations, you can reach out to me via the Oregon Remembrance Project website. Um, there's a contact page. Uh, one of the ways that I invite people to get involved is inviting me to speak to their community. Uh, so I would be happy to talk with you and your community, um, not just about you know, the contents of this work, uh, what it means in terms of the, the grander scheme of history, but you know, in my normal talks, the main takeaway really is that idea of you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do extraordinary things. Uh, when I took my trip to the South, I didn't have this grand proclamation about, I'm going to come home and rewrite the ending to stories of historical injustice. Um, I went to the South and in my head thought, yo, that shit's kind of fucked up. <laughs> I got to tell people. And then I got to tell people became, I got to do something, and I got to do something became, I want to make a change. Uh, you know, I like to tell people that I wish it was my idea to use the word sunrise for the Sunrise Project, um, but that idea came from a 69-year-old white male truck driver from Grants Pass named Randolph, um, which 
highlights the beauty of this work that it really is just ordinary people coming together to try to do something extraordinary. Um, and so I would like to share with you and your communities not just the content of this work, but also this charge and hopefully the sense of empowerment that we can actually do things as ordinary citizens by learning to not ask the question, why me? But instead start learning the question, learning to ask the question, why not me? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you can find me um, on the Oregon Remembrance Project website. Uh, there's a little big button that says get involved. Um, there's a contact form. OregonRemembrance.org. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Instagram or Facebook. Not me as an individual because I don't really use social media because I'm a weird millennial. Um, but uh, you can find the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media. Um, in terms of funding, that has been an interesting journey. So I've, I've been doing this work for the last six years, but have only been a 501c3 for since May of last year. Um, and then I got married in June. Uh, so then I, um, so then I wasn't doing anything in, in July, uh, but then come the fall is when I first started fundraising. Um, and I had thought that doing something that had never been done before would to give me a leg up in fundraising. Um, but what I've experienced so far is that's kind of been a detriment where um, I'm not, I, I get a lot of your work is so important, it just unfortunately doesn't match up with our funding priorities. Um, sometimes it's considered not, it's not rural enough because I happen to live in Portland. Um, it's considered not black enough because I work with a lot of white people. Um, I don't meet historic preservation requirements because I'm not dealing with physical buildings, but stories and memories. Um, and so it's been a real journey to, uh, to, to try and, and fund this. Um, and so, uh, you know, things are progressing, starting to, to pick up some wins, um, but it is a real journey. And if you are interested in supporting financially, um, your dollar really will go a long ways. Um, one of the things that, you know, your money would directly go towards is uh, the growth of Juneteenth as a holiday across Oregon. Um, I have found myself working with Oregon City, Gladstone, Milwaukee, Coos Bay, Grants Pass, and Ashland, um, all for Juneteenth 2024. Um, and so your money will go towards uh, helping be able to bring these holidays uh, to communities that have historically not celebrated them. Um, and so... Remember the three T's, you can help via your time, your talent, or your treasure. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Oregon Remembrance Project is one individual, but that doesn't mean this is an individual effort. Um, and so I welcome your support um, in this endeavor. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Um, how do you balance Just to repeat the question, you said, um, how do we feel about this pushback against critical race theory happening right now and people saying, well, we don't want to hear about this, right? And sharing the story. And sharing the story. Somehow people in America feel very ashamed by hearing these stories, these stories, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you, sort of, as composers and creators, sort of balancing with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, when I, so I got a master's of social work from Portland State um, between, woo, uh, between 2020 and 2021. Um, and when I was in my master's program, I interned at an organization called Lines for Life, uh, which is a suicide and substance abuse prevention organization. So if someone calls the National Suicide Hotline from an Oregon area code, it gets routed to Lines for Life. And so even though I was in the Department of Communication, I still went through the training for those who were on the phone lines. And one thing from that training that I applied to the work that I do now is when you're on the phones with someone, you are helping them, quote, unpack their luggage. But what you can't do is end the call with their stuff all strewn about. 
you have to help them repackage their emotions, their feelings, before you can end that call. And so I take that same approach to community organizing where if I'm going to help you unpack your history, i got to let you know that we're not going to leave it all strewn about. We're going to repackage it into something new. So in many of the communities that I work with, we're, we're unpacking the history of racial exclusion, but we're also repackaging it into this vision of a sunrise community. Um, I play a game when I go to Grants Pass called Can I Get This Random Stranger to Support My Project? <laughs> um, and so I'll just I'll start telling them. Um, and people like go through this process visually. When I say sundown, their face goes sad. When two seconds later I say sunrise, their face goes happy. Um, and so in my experience, um, uh, making sure that people don't get stuck in that feeling of our histories all strewn about um, and giving people the idea that they can actually funnel their energy towards something, that they can create something new, um, gets at that feeling of powerlessness that comes with unearthing these stories of injustice. Um, and admittedly, I do play a little bit to people's pride where you're like, okay, Coos Bay, let's do this thing so that you can be better than Portland who wishes they were like that. Um, and you know, it's, we're, we're Americans. We love to be number one. So I was like, let's be number one in the country for historical reconciliation. Um, and so it has been surprising how um, just giving people this feeling that they have power in these situations helps break down those feelings of hesitation and resistance? I think also just when it comes to reconciling racial atrocities and trauma, if you approach people with a sense of compassion, um, it's not about shaming. It is about understanding so that we don't repeat. And I think if people can feel that, they can feel that comfortable with you. Um, you can move past all of the guilt and shame that comes with um, rehashing these stories. They have to, they have to see in you uh, an intent to, to fix, an intent to connect, an intent to, um, to heal. That, that's how I've, I've moved forward in generally this work as a, as a um, how should I say, uh, equity I don't want to say, just as a e person who believes in equity, especially racial equity, I've moved forward and gotten a long way with a lot of people by just being compassionate and showing that, showing my heart first so that you see that I'm not here trying to make you feel bad for something. Because a lot of times what we get in this work is I'm, I, I, I'm not responsible. I wasn't here when that happened. And so people disconnect from the work. So if you can make them feel comfortable, then... It works. I also think a lot about this, like Resonance Ensemble does a lot of different concerts that are exploring different, um, different people's experiences, different stories, different um, ideas that are, are really pressing. And it's hard to argue with somebody standing up saying, well, this is my experience, right? This is, this is the, um, the work that I'm doing, this is how far I've come, you know, this is what I feel like our world needs. You know, it's, it's a very personal, so again, this idea of empathy and of, of connection, um, and I think we're really, in a way, fortunate to be able to do it with music because I think it generates a kind of a receptivity and openness um, to, to empathy and, and to, to caring about, about the community. And of course, choral singing is embodying that, right? I mean, this group of people creating something together. So, so I think there's a way that we're able to invite people into a space where there's some contemplation and, um, and, and connection. Darren. I, I really appreciate your question. I think it's a challenging, um, it's a challenging question. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't have an answer um, to the whole thing, but something that I've noticed that, you know, we, because of the trauma that we were dealing with in the aftermath of George Floyd, there was um, sort of a lot of anger and um, recrimination and and sort of the just the opening to talk about how bad it had been and unveiling to be heard. Um, but I don't think 
to me, that was never the place we were going to land, right? Representation is absolutely crucial, and telling the stories is absolutely crucial, but it's not the place that we're going to land. And just like in any other trauma, you sort of have to get past everybody just, you know, tossing their shit around and being angry to get to be able to see a future together. And I, that's one of the things I really love about what Taylor is saying is that he's just writing new endings to the stories, right? He's just saying, oh, no, we stopped there. And it was so terrible that we just buried it and erased it, tried to erase it. But what if we didn't stop there? What if we brought it up recognizing and holding the entire time that we're not going to let you go? This terrible thing happened in your community. This terrible thing happened. Your ancestors, whoever you know, did it, are, um, but we, it does not have to stay in stasis with you. And I guess the other thing that has become apparent to me is that um, this work is best done when you can actually look in the eye of the other people and find some kind of a we. Like as long as you're talking about you did this and you did that and you, 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 then there's not really the possibility of healing. But if you can find some way, some place to say, to, to, to connect to the we, um, and I love the idea that it's like, <laughs> you know, Grant's Pass is the we, we're Grant's Pass, we, you know, and, and I just, you know, finding, finding a way, and, but recognizing that we all as humans have these sort of allegiances and these connections, the intersections. Um, so I think that, so I'm, I'm not hopeful about my doing this work, maybe as an artist, on a national scale, I think my job is to do this work as an artist in communities where I can be a we. And I can always build those communities. I always, can always enhance those communities. But I can't, you know, waltz in from the outside and tell people that, you know, they need to change things. So I think I'm going to work more closely in this sort of circle and know that that will resonate, know that there's magical energy in that, that it will be seen and it will be, that energy will pick, be picked up in places far from me, but I don't have to do all the work everywhere. Good. Yes, thank you. Can I ask you a ridiculously hard question? Of course. Um, so the role of music in remembering, I think there's a path there that's really clear. Um, and it works really well to remember a life, to remember a turmoil, to remember something benevolent. And, you know, it's, it's in looking back, and it's really a natural way to process that. But we're also in a world where, you know, we might be rewriting these stories, but we've got, like, all of this stuff swirling around, all of these current stories. What is the role of music with that, like when we're looking at Palestinian Israeli conflict and we're looking at, you know, our own internal divisions and how we can get on the same page with even the work that is being done that is obviously moving us forward and we can't even get on the same page. So I don't know, I'm just I'm asking a really difficult question of you. <laughs> I love those. <laughs> you know, because you're programming and because your programming is very, really very progressive and um, relevant and compassionate. And so I'm just wondering what you're thinking about this current time, like in terms of where you're going next. That's an amazing question. Could you all hear it in the back there? So yes, great. So. Um, OK, I'm like, I'm, I'm chewing on a few things. One. Um, Fun fact is that my my original sort of like scholarly interest in you know graduate school was on the idea of the requiem and this idea of music as exactly what you're saying like the commemoration of a life of an idea. Um, looking at some of the you know different requiems, um, Brahms's German requiem, the idea that people could write something or put something together that would give everybody this kind of a, like a sacred moment of communal mourning, right? A communal grief. Um, and that's, you know, I have many types of music that, that I'm drawn to, but that was something that kind of called my name. And so there's something around um, in Resonance's story where um, 
we started to realize through a series of things you can read about on our website, but about we had several, several issues here in Portland and around the art, artistic community in Portland that made us realize that what we wanted to do was double down on um, being really mindful of calling attention to contemporary issues and contemporary experiences and racial injustice and gender injustice and everything, but also, again, through not just sitting in the trauma of it all, but thinking about how can we use our music to move things forward and to celebrate and to pay tribute. So there's a way to say, like, we're using music, I'm like making this up as I go here, but we're using music to um, commemorate like a, a moment in time right now and a kind of an experience right now. And I think that this model, which involves commissioning poets and composers and visual artists and, and folks to really think about um, what kind of world they want us to, to see and to, to dream and experiences to know together. Um, there's a way that you kind of, you know, I'm not a super religious person, but you sort of, it's like you make it holy in that same way that you're like looking back and um, mourning someone with grief. You're, you're saying like, this is something that is meaningful, so meaningful that I need to add music to the, situation to explore the feelings that that's engendering. So I think that, that the way that we turn to music for thinking about our past can also let us think about our present as well. Did that kind of answer your question? I mean, it's not a question. Yeah, totally. That's one of those questions. I'm going to be chewing on that for months, but I love that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Would, I think we have time for... Oh, sorry, oh, go sorry. ahead. Would it be reasonable to think about an answer to that question in the same way that we think about medicine, right? I mean, we have over-the-counter medicines that we just take when we're just like, oh, I got a headache, right? And then on the other hand, we have surgery, like life-saving surgery that we get. But I think, and so I think th there's a level of thought and development and sort of high-level performance that's different between those those two things. So we could decide that one of the ways that we wanted to use our musical abilities is to make the over-the-counter stuff, to just make it better, to just make it, you know, holistic or <laughs> whatever, um, eliopath you know, um, and different, different types of things, um, naturopathic. Um, but I'm also thinking about um, triage medicine, right? I mean, if you go into a war zone, you don't have, you just bring what you have, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I was just, what I was looking up on my phone was that um, uh, Esperanza Spalding just posted um, a compilation called In Solidarity with Palestine, a comp compilation for musical aid. And she sent a demo into that record, right? She didn't go into the studio. She didn't like take, you know, hours and hours and days and days and collect people and make something really polished. She just like wrote a song, demoed it and sent it in. And so I think there's that, if we think about the practice that we have of music making, then, and we think of ourselves as sort of treating, um, you know, or addressing or, healing, if you want to use that word, um, then maybe we could sort of use our various tools in these various and different ways. And so for immediate challenges, um, we're in triage mode and we do whatever we have to do. We just sort of put it out there in the world, try and join together to create energy around it. And then when we have time, we plan these beautiful programs and we bring people in and we commission new pieces and we do all those things as well. But all of it is necessary. I love that. And also just your, your metaphor makes me also think there are a lot of concerts you can go to. And so also like kudos to all of you, but um, there are a lot of concerts you can go to for um, <laughs> recreational drugs to really take this, but <laughs> to, uh, to like, um, or, you know, your homeopathic would be a better way. I don't know where I went with this. Um, but the idea, you can go to something to be transported out of the world's problems, right? Or you can go to a concert where you know you're going to like go deeply in with the performers and like, and that you trust them, we hope to, um, carry you through and I love I'm taking thank you so much that's amazing the like if you're gonna unpack the luggage you also have to find a new way to put it back together so like and and how are we then gonna move ourselves forward so anyway so I I think that's a big part of it too is like using music not just as sort of a generic balm to the soul but to um 
ask things of you that are somehow like deeper and, and truer. Um, so yeah, thank you. And I feel like it comes back, um, I, uh, I don't know that we got your name over here, but it kind of comes back to your point about um, you know, outside critics or sort of push back on the topics that we're discussing. It kind of doesn't matter what, what they say. The, that it's sort of a, a self-selecting community that, that finds us and continues to come back for uh, what we offer and what you bring then in these conversations after the concert um, and the topics that come up. You know, I'm so glad that you like put up Palestine and like when we're talking about Palestine, we're talking about Congo, we're talking about Sudan, we're talking about Kashmir, like we're talking about like an international struggle. And, and all of that is here too. Um, and so when we continue to sort of build community in this way, um, we find the like-minded folks and we, we find our, our, our community and our home in that way too, a political home, I think, comes um, through the arts. So it's really special, yeah. Well, uh, yes, uh, last question. Oh gosh, there's so many questions. We'll try to be quicker. Okay, yes, and then yes, and then we will be done. Yes, so in the middle, thank you. I have so much to say about oh, it's yeah. short. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, you're amazing. Woo! You're amazing. And I want to tell you that you're not the only one in this work. And even though we're sitting in this space, and I have a very um, quite-centered space with a stage and an audience, you're doing really important work. It's also dangerous. And I want to say that to you because we can pretend it's not. They are intentionally not giving you money. They don't want the story to be told. Mm -hmm. There are some people intentionally doing that. I came here to work at a school called Captain Gable, mm -hmm. where I met these beautiful people who ushered their children, <laughs> Daryl and Baby, through Captain Gable. And now I sit at a school, Kairos PX. We mm -hmm. would love to hear your story, mm -hmm. which is a multicultural community with a culturally specific purpose. I went from looking at black trauma and children of color trauma and gender trauma, trauma trauma, to joyful black joy. And I love this sunset to sunrise thing. Yeah. And I know it's, is it Randolph? Yeah. I think it's really important to tell our white allies when they do something important. But there are people who are not our allies, to your point, who are going to intentionally make you stop telling that story. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to dim your light. Mm -hmm. I just don't want you to go in there naive. And I don't want you to go there alone. So I know funding sources that we can connect mm -hmm. and collectively do some things. I was going to find you anyway, <laughs> because I'm an educator, and I was born in 1962. So I'm an elder here. Also, I want to say Langston Hughes created jazz poetry. Mm -hmm. And Mimi keeps saying, it's not, I didn't do the music. You are the music. Mm -hmm. I know you. Mm -hmm. I know you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I have had some experience with the forces who are not as big of fans um, of this work. Um, so when we were doing the Alonzo Tucker uh, historical marker and, and all that, uh, the political climate in Coos Bay was very tense. Um, and so with good reason, um, before I traveled to Coos Bay for the historical marker, unveiling, you know, there's, there's a document on my computer called If I Die, um, where I, I lay out my vision for what I want to happen in Oregon. Um, and so, you know, some people did show up with their Trump flags and gun racks, um, but uh, over, over the, you know, it was overwhelmingly safe. Um, and so, you know, I, I, a lot of my heroes have died. Um, and so I, you know, recognize the, the danger that's in this work, but then also the 
the non-life-threatening forces that try to keep this at bay. Um, you know, I, there is a point this last December where I was like, what am I even doing? Um, this isn't really working out. Um, I'm married now. I can't just be poor and live with my parents. Um, and so I, you know, had this moment where I was like, do I find something else to do with my life? Um, and sort of speaking of music, um, I never really listened to this person much growing up, um, but I ended up finding uh, a lot of inspiration from the music of an uh, American poet named Eminem. Uh, <laughs> um, and in particular, in the song Lose Yourself, uh, there's a line that success is my only motherfucking option, failure's not. Um, and so that kind of resonated with me where I just sort of reminded myself that, you know, when you've been knocked down, you really have no choice but to get back up. Um, and so I really have, I've, you know, sequestered that thought of, do I need to find something else? Um, because really this is the only thing that I'll be doing with my life. Um, and so I'm encouraged to be able to connect with folks like yourself um, who want to see this work grow. Uh, my, my wife works for Good Coffee, who um, has a partnership. Yeah. Um, so I would love to continue that partnership uh, in addition uh, to having my wife's company. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. Okay, last question. Yes. Really, question five. Um, the Oregon Cultural Trust does list the Remembrance Project as one of its organizations that you can donate to the Remembrance Project and then donate to the Cultural Trust. Mm -hmm. So if you Thank you. Yeah, you should all know about the Oregon Cultural Trust, which has a wonderful tax incentive for you to give. Um, and so if you give to an organization that's part of the Cultural Trust, um, then you can essentially get that money back in your tax return through donating to the Cultural Trust as well. I didn't say that right. You can also give to the Cultural Trust and then get that money back in your tax return. Um, and the Cultural Trust will further use that um, to then uh, make donations to such fine organizations as the Oregon Remembrance Project and Resonance Ensemble, also part of that. So, <laughs> yay. Thank you. And, and don't forget the uh, gig guide. Yes. The gig guide, uh-huh. Yeah, you got yourselves on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we wind down this uh, Q&A portion, I want to emphasize that this work is really done by ordinary people. Um, I was not this person um, for the majority of my life. Uh, I will always say I missed out on one of the most important days of my life in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected the first black president of the United States because had I been old enough, I would have voted for John McCain and Sarah Palin. In 2012, I would have voted for Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. I graduated high school a registered Republican with the dream of becoming a tough on crime prosecutor. I gave a speech my junior year of college in favor of capital punishment. Um, and so as I do this work, I tell people, I don't get people to see new values, but to see the values they already have in a new way. Uh, and that just like Randolph, it is never too late to make a difference. Uh, and that this work simply requires faith, faith to take the first step even when you don't see the full staircase courage to start on a journey even when you don't know where it's going to lead. And luckily, courage isn't something you're born with. It's a choice that you make over and over again. It requires faith and courage to believe that you can be the change you want to see in this world. Because let me tell you, you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do extraordinary things. Thank you. Thank you for that, and that's so true. But I was also going to say, if any of you want to continue to see mission-driven music, which is what I call it, come to the Resonance concerts. It really has just changed my perspective on music, on classical music, on choir, just because every concert embraces something that is important to some of us, if not all. There is always something that sparks an interest that connects people. I've seen this over and over on many Sundays where people get connected to do good work. Shohei, thank you so much. You're just, it's just so, so much peace to look at you 
direct and say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> he'll let me figure it out. Daryl, your talent, unmatched, unmatched. I played um, the piano piece off the radio for my friends in Dallas, Texas, and one of them plays organ at his church, and he's like, what? Play that again, play that again. He kept saying, repeat it. I'm like, I don't understand, but okay, I'll repeat it. So it's great stuff. Kathy, thank you so much. I wanted to say thank you to Liz and to Kim. They're, they're, and Nicholas. Nicholas, Nicholas, it's this, I, I thought about this when you said, oh, it's just us people, just normal people that do remarkable things and Resonance does remarkable things. So thank you. And to everybody, sound, photography, everybody. Yes, Instagram, everybody. <laughs> Instagram, right? <laughs> Graham. Oh, Graham. oh. <laughs> thanks, Graham. <laughs> I said Instagram. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Oh, fill out your surveys. Is that what you said, Liz? Oh, she said thank you. Okay, I'm adding fill out your surveys. Yay. All right. Thank you all.